Octagon in 1993. I was supposed to be here for three weeks, and I stayed for two years. One of the first things that I learned when I came to Ghana was instructions from my brother. He pointed to Audrey Gajapo, and he said, follow her. Just follow her. So whatever Audrey was doing, I was supposed to do some, because that's what women in Ghana who were making a difference did. So I just followed Audrey. Wherever she went, I went some. Mm. My first job as a journalist, if you'd like, was reporting from Parliament in 1993. I see Liz. It was a one-party Parliament, so frankly, what is there to say other than, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> to report. But I had a column and I had to fill it. And so what I did was I filled it with reporting of the parliamentarians who didn't come to work. My column was called the, the Week That Was. In those days, the Chronicle was a weekly newspaper. It was one of, I think, only three. There was the Statesman, there was the Chronicle, and the Free Press. That's it. Wow. So you had to be with one of those. And that was, I'm talking about the in, independent media. Of course, there was the Graphic, there was the Times. But in terms of the independent media, that was it. So my first job, if you can call it that, was really assistant to the assistant of the assistant reporter. Go to Parliament. <laughs> Go to Parliament and produce, I think, 500 words. There's nothing to report. So I had to find the news. And I found the news in a really interesting way because it was a new Parliament. Don't forget, 1993, most people didn't have experience of Parliament. So the Speaker and the rest of us were all going through the standing orders together. It was like every day, Mr. Speaker, can we read standing order two? I'm like, yep. So I learned the standing orders at the same time that the parliamentarians did, and that was what my column was. Welcome, because we'd had about 20 years where there was no parliament, so that was my first job. Then I went on to work with Audrey, who had started what was in those days, our magazine. It was, I believe, the first Ghanaian female-edited monthly magazine. <laughs> So I followed Audrey. See, I follow instructions. So I went to work with Audrey, and then Audrey left, of course, to go and pursue higher education. And I followed her. I had a decision to make, whether I wanted to go to business school, very difficult since I can't count, um, <laughs> go to law school, doable, but that's too many books to read, or go to journalism. Well, I had to go to school, obviously. I couldn't just hang around. So I decided to apply to Columbia Journalism School in the hope that I wouldn't get in. They accepted me. What's wrong with these people? They accepted me. So I went to Columbia Journalism School and decided that this is what I love. I love finding different parts of narratives and building a story. I love it. My first proper, if you like, beat job, everybody else got the posh jobs. I was sent to the Bronx to join um, a, police <laughs> a police raid on a building. They gave me a bulletproof vest. That is when I thought, maybe I should have gone to law school. <laughs> I would have been safer. And so we get to this place, and they're saying, OK, you have to stand behind us. And then the first, poof, like a self-respecting Ghanaian woman, I went to the ground. <laughs> So there are some parts of this journalism, the Christian Amampu, you know, out there that I don't like. So I was finding out about myself. I, I, that this is not me. This is not me. When I came back to Ghana, it was very exciting. Ghana at the time had the best performing stock exchange. Um, the economy was booming. Ashanti Goldfields had listed on the New York Stock Exchange for the first time. I had an internship at the Wall Street Journal, and everybody was saying, oh my God, we have to find Sam Jonah. I said, oh, Uncle Sam. And they said, you know him? Said, ah, he's my uncle. <laughs> Your family network. You gotta work friends and family. We're not related at all. But I called several people and got a hold of Sam Jonah, and I got the interview for the Wall Street Journal. They paid me $500 in those days. Wow. Uncle Sam. So when I came back to Ghana, I came back and I was 
followed Audrey, worked at the School of Communication Studies, teaching broadcast journalism, but I was also corresponding for the Dow Jones Newswires, covering cocoa, gold, and financial matters. I am pleased to tell you that there is no job that I've ever taken where I've known exactly what I was going to do until I walked in. I have no idea, but I have a sense that I can do something. And that kind of bravery, I think you get it because you've got people like Elizabeth or Hene. It's, you can do it. You can do it. If she could do it and you could do it, of course I can. When I was teaching, um, when I told my mother I was going to teach at the University of Ghana, she said, how are you going to do that? Because you stammer. I do stammer. How are you going to teach? How are you going to do live radio, live television? You stammer. I can't say that my first couple of classes went very well, but we've managed. <laughs> I have an odd way of speaking, and people say, why does she sound like that? Because I'm trying to get to my next word. That's why. <laughs> Thank you. This is so... Um, <laughs> so I think for me, the 1990s was a fascinating time because it was a very political experience if you were in the media. I was in Ghana when Radio I started the whole conversation about independent radio and the demonstrations that took place. I was in Ghana when people like Kweku Bakun were arrested um, because speech was criminalized and if you said certain things or wrote about certain things, you could be picked up. It did happen. It's not a story. It did happen. So it was a very different different experience of learning how to want to say something and to be able to say it without being arrested. So that's kind of my experience and I've enjoyed it. When I look at what you were saying about your experience about being invisible, we were not invisible but there were very few of us and it was politically dangerous times. Being in the media in the 1990s into the early 2000s was a very tough political space to be in. It wasn't about your lack of ability or your lack of access. It was about the political space that was extremely difficult. And of course, if you have a very interesting approach to life as I do, then you get into a lot of trouble. When I taught at the School of Communication Studies, I took my students to cover the Asante Hines funeral, Utum for um, II. Now, if you work in a university, you're supposed to fill in some forms and ask permission, aren't you? I skipped that bit because it was very exciting. We had found, and he's died recently, but he was an amazing man, um, Buckner. Mr. Buckner had opened a radio and television station in Kumasi, and he said, if you can get your students here, you can use our cameras and you can go and record. We literally wrote the script in the STC as we all went up. It was very exciting. And we were allowed to film in Mencia, my students and myself. We brought back this documentary, we edited it, we got help from Professor A.C. Sutherland and Professor Irene Odote. For me, these are the reasons why, as difficult as it was then, these amazing women who were there and were able to lend a hand to somebody who wanted to do everything, but they helped to shape where I was going. So that's my experience.